What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith with another GSD Mode podcast interview. So today, you guys, as always, another badass guest in the show. Um, any dude that's rolling a Lambo is a badass, right? Whether you like the car or not, man, it, it, it takes uh, some mad money to be able to roll in a Lambo. So today, you guys, we got a special guest in the show. This is a second time repeat guest. Um, our first podcast, we had him on Blue Up, right? I mean... I know between all, all the all the mediums out there, I don't know, 15 plus thousand downloads, a lot of great positive feedback from the dude, um, ex-professional athlete that got into real estate, um, just killed it door knocking and pounding the phones. And in the last 12 months, his business has been on fire, right? So almost doubling his business. Um, he's, he's learned the power of leverage, right? So he's added agents onto his team, support staff, and he's increased his net, even though he's hiring, right? And, and, and growing his expenses and, and having to split commissions with agents, he's increased his um, net on net income from last year to this year um, by 30%. Right, so this dude is doing massive things, and uh, we go deep. Right, first podcast interview, which we're gonna have a link to um, in the show notes here, which you can see how he built his real estate business. We talk uh, a little bit more in depth on that one on the exact door knocking scripts. This one, of course, we still are hitting door knocking. We're, start, we're talking expireds, door knocking materials, um, but more importantly, the power of leverage that's taken his business, uh, um, doubled his business in twelve months. Um, also. Not only is he netting more money, um, he's getting his life back, you know, right? He's working far, far less hours, almost half the hours that he was was working and, and uh, going out there and creating massive success. So real quick, though, before we jump into today's podcast, I want to plug our sponsors that make sh- today's show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com. So this is the website, CRM, that I use in my business, that I go out there and dominate with my business, man. When we're talking massive amounts of lead generation, um, I'm generating well over 60 leads every single day on Facebook uh, through Facebook lead ads at uh, $3 each lead. So this allows you the system, the tools that you need that are necessary to go out there and do that. Plus we provide you all the training and the know-how so you can go out there and become a lead generation machine. So you're not paying 40 bucks to go generate some lead on Zillow, Realtor.com or or one of these third party uh, 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 dudes are, are charged to take advantage of the real estate community, right? So we teach you how to go out there and fish for yourself. And it's also backed by an insanely powerful CRM that's very easy, very effective, very efficient to go out there and use. And I've pre-written all all of the drips in there. So all the thousand day follow-up protocols, all the scripts, what to say, when to say, how to say it. They don't answer what voicemail to leave. It's it's 100% guest proof, right? It's all inside the system. Um, so again, that's www.perfectstormnow.com. If and when you register, make sure to use promo code MASTERY, P-S-N, M-A-S-T-E-R-Y, P-S-N, all caps, all one word, all together, that'll save you the $200 registration fee and allow the program, there's no contracts, it's month to month with that promo code, um, so you can make sure that you like the system, which I know you're gonna freaking love it, right? Um, So check us out there. So our next uh, 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 sponsor, REO University, so that's at www.reo.com reomasteryuniversity.com. This is a 22-module, in-depth, hardcore, online uh, online digital training course that myself and my business partner, Ben Barber, uh, went out there and created. So I have a ton of REO experience servicing over 35 banks in my career. Ben worked on the, the side of the banks um, as an asset manager and has sold over 11,000 REO assets from the asset management side. So we teamed up with our skill sets, with our knowledge, and created this insane program that shows you how to get into REO, how to service the REO, how to expand and grow REO and continue kicking ass in REO as well as short sales. So if and when the market tanks, right, your business is recession proof. There's no such thing as a bad market, right? A good, bad market, right? It's always good for someone. And there's no reason that just because the the market drops doesn't mean that your business needs to drop. You just need to learn how to shift, adapt, and change. That way your business can constantly grow. So check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. It's only $997 or three payments of $333. Our last sponsor is my 90-Day Mastery Bootcamp, which is my personal mentorship program. Um, Over uh, uh, 36 live hours of 
coaching and training with me personally. Um, we got three to three and a half hours every single week of in-depth hardcore training. I give you my entire operations manual. I give you every tracker, every presentation, all my materials in my business. I give you everything that we use in my business step-by-step that's helped me sell over 5,000 homes, over a billion dollars in real estate sales, um, and it's helping my team to sell well over 600 homes in 2017. So I give it all to you. I don't just give it to you. I show you, tell you, and I give you in-depth instruction on what to do, why to do it, how to implement, how to be successful with this. It's a plug and play system. You also get four months of daily access to me as your personal mentor inside the program. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, hella cheap, right? So uh, 90daymastery.com. When you register, make sure to enter promo code live mastery. L-I-V-E-M-A-S-T-E-R-Y, Live Mastery, all caps, all one word, all together. That's where you'll get the biggest discount. I think right now you can save a thousand bucks on the program, you know, right? Um, well, I don't know when you're listening to this, if you listen to this a couple years down the road, that may be gone, but at least as of the time you're recording this, that's what we got going on. So check us out, 90daymastery.com. Make sure to do promo code Live Mastery. All right, you guys, we are going to jump on in today's show. So we got uh, Brian Casella part two. Let's dive on in. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GS Demo podcast interview. Every single week, we interview top badasses and just straight up uh, um, entrepreneurs that are dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, we got a repeat guest on. This is a dude we had on about a year ago, um, and his episode blew up. I think uh, between you know all the channels, we and we had uh, well over you know fifteen thousand downloads between all the channels, and it was received really well. And also, not not just that. I mean, this dude in twelve months, um, um, not just his real estate business has more than doubled, but he's got so many other things going on. So I want to reinvite him on just to talk about all this amazing stuff he's created in the last twelve months. Really stoked to have Brian Cassell on the uh, show. Welcome to the show again, my friend. Gosh, man, thanks for having me again, brother. I see you doing big things too, dude. So you're definitely one of the people I, I look at to just keep pushing the envelope, man, constantly. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Well, you know, you know how it goes. If you're not growing, you're dying. And, and yeah, I think dudes like you and I, we're just wired where it's like we always got to have that challenge and we always got to, you know, level up to the next level. If we don't, it's like there's something incomplete going on, you know, right? Absolutely, man. I totally agree, dude. It's like a bug. Maybe it's a virus that we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. So, um, all right. So, and we'll have a link. Those of you that uh, are watching us, if you didn't see Brian's first interview, there's going to be a link below. Um, that really talks about his journey, getting into real estate, talks about his uh, uh, professional sports career that led him here and, and all of that stuff and how he's built his, his real estate business, um, right? I mean, really through, at the time, it was massive door knocking and just pounding the pavement and, you know, but I know that, uh, you know, you've made some transitions, man. So let's just kind of pick up where, where what's, what's happened in the last 12 years. I know you're doing other things outside of real estate, but let's first talk about your real estate business, man. Like what, what are some of the shifts that you've done and your focus that have helped you double your business in the last 12 months? Yeah, well, it's basically embracing leverage, man. I used to resist it so hard because I I came up through the Mike Ferry uh, coaching, which was great. It got me running, but he was so agent centric, meaning you run your own business, you get one assistant and you just, you're the man and you keep rocking and rolling. And I started realizing that, you know, I'm working 12, 14, 16 hours a day and I'm, I'm reaching a ceiling, right? I can do better things with my time. So I started hiring. I have a couple agents now. I have uh, three employees that are TCs and a part-time assistant. And I've literally doubled my business. I work probably in my real estate business about half the time that I did the last 12 months leading up to this leveraging. And I'm on track to net for myself probably 30% more than I did last year. So if you just look at it that way, it makes so much more sense, right? And we're not even talking about the other stuff that I'm doing. So it, it basically was a shift, Josh, from the employee mindset to being a CEO and a, running a business, right? And I think that's where uh, a lot of people don't see the light and they get too stuck in their ways. And I definitely raise my hand and say I, I was guilty of doing that. But adopting this new mindset definitely has, has been the, the major shift. And, and you heard it, ladies and gentlemen, I'm working half the time in the real estate business and I'm making more money. I mean, that totally makes more sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, well, and, it, and it's not that realtors, it's not just on realtors, right? It's most entrepreneurs, they, they pigeonhole themselves and have a high paying job. And, you know, one of my favorite books, I, I'm sure you probably read it, uh, The E-Myth Revisited, you know, right, which does such a brilliant job about, uh, you know, helping walk through and, and get that right entrepreneur mindset. It's like, good. at the end of the day, we're entrepreneurs, it just happens to be that we picked real estate as one of our entrepreneur ventures. And, um, you know, true wealth comes from value multiplied by leverage, you know, right? And, and you've got that down. So then let's, let, let's kind of walk through what you've done here because most people then when they start a team, do they do it wrong? You know, right. They, they like, Oh, I got these leads coming in. Let me start hiring some agents before they hire an admin or, 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 you know, they go through these journeys, but for you to do all this in the last 12 months and net more money, that tells me that you, you, you grew it the right way out of the gate. So kind of walk us through, um, like what were those hires? What did it look like? You know, how, how is, how's the growth progressed with that? Okay. Uh, it's been pretty simple. You know, I originally picked up the millionaire real estate agent, uh, that book. And I kind of remember reading that and I read the book two or three times and I was like, okay, obviously they figured something out here. So, uh, the first thing I did was I hired a part-time admin, right? And I started delegating a lot. I took my time and said, okay, what, what are some items that I want this person to cover? And I basically wanted to take away all the 10, 15, $20 an hour work off my plate, you know, and give that to the part-time admin, right? Like, you know, sending out the, the mailers to our database, you know, answering emails, stuff like that. So I, I got the part-time admin in place. And what's funny is I, I kept saying I was going to do it. And I took from the moment I made the decision, it took three months dude, to get the admin. And I always laugh. I'm like, man, if I would have gotten that admin originally, how much farther ahead would I be already? So I got the admin. And then I would say about two months later, I hired my girlfriend, Loida, who um, I think you guys are going to interview too, to come on as a buyer's agent. And she started doing some buyers for me. And quickly I realized that, you know what, I can actually use her as well as uh, start training her to be a listing agent, right? So I had her doing both, but originally it was just buyers. Three months later, uh, one friend of mine who originally I had in mind to hire on my team as a buyer's agent, um, that didn't work out. So I ended up getting another guy who just followed me on social media, brought him through the interview process. It worked out. He was strictly a buyer's agent as well. And from there, it was just about fine tuning, getting the right TC team, right? I have a TC team of, uh, it's three TCs actually in one. They actually work for my Keller Williams office. So I said, why not just use them? Interviewed them, uh, gave them basically a sheet of what I wanted them to do. They agreed. And it's just been running really smooth, man. Uh, other than that, it's just been about nailing down our systems, right? We just brought on this new, um, I forget what it's called, but it's for Facebook. Basically, we're going to start advertising a lot on Facebook because we're still doing a lot of uh, the old school stuff, you know, but we've built up such a big database now. I think we have over 700 people now in our database that that's continuously giving us leads. And we're seeing that percentage of repeat referral business explode from maybe eight to 9% the year before to now it's closer to about 25%, which is really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it, dude. Yeah, it's, I'm such a big believer in having a, a strong combination of an offline, uh, uh, you know, whether it's prospecting marketing, but a strong offline component and then a strong online. You know, like I know you're heavy door knockers, you know, and the door knocking is, you know, I'm heavy open houses, but, you know, um, but then I'm heavy Facebook, you yeah. know, right? Um, and yeah, Facebook just slays it, dude. It's like per five grand I spend, you know, it makes me, you know, right. And this is net on net after I pay my ISAs, pay my agents, right. Per, per five grand spend that nets me about 30 grand, you know, right. After splits and, and it's just, it's a juggernaut, right. But yeah, you combine those two, it's game over, dude. So are you still, so you're still working about six hours a day or so. Um, walk us through like what your day to day is, man. Are you still hitting the doors or is your time now more just spent keeping your agents accountable? What does your day look like? Well, my hardcore prospecting that used to be like five, six hours a day now has pretty much been cut, I would say, to a quarter of what it was before. I'm still calling, you know, fresh expires. I'm still door knocking a little bit. Um, most of my contacts now, aside from maybe hotter stuff like the physicals and the expires, is mostly our repeat and referral business. You know, it's our sphere of influence. It's making those connections stronger. And yeah, just training uh, my team, thinking about new stuff. And really, a lot of that time now is spent on social media, too, because I didn't realize it, but we were actually getting a good amount of referrals from agent to agent referrals. Yeah. So I'm sure that I was really buckling down with that because I, I forgot that in the space uh, of YouTube and Facebook and you know Instagram and all this stuff that 
I was like the go-to person for everybody in Southern California. And I look last month, dude, we closed two deals last, last month just from agent to agent referrals. So that's really exploding. But I would say if, if we're looking at that six hour window, we're probably looking at about an hour and a half or two hours of prospecting, probably 30, 45 minutes of follow-up, um, 30, 45 minutes with uh, my admin team, you know, just making sure everything's good to go. And then I would say the last hour and a half, two hours are just implementing new systems with my team and training them and just staying on top of them to make sure everything's operating smoothly. Yeah. And then with you, like one thing, um, you know, that, that, and this is from observation, right? So I, I don't know your inside now numbers, but it sounds like it's working from what you just said, but just being a dude that, you know, we're friends on Facebook and, you know, I see what you're doing out there and it just seems like you do such a brilliant job at having that. I hate the word balance, but I think with our social media, it's like, we, we've got to, we've got to live our lives somewhat vicariously, keep people interested. I mean, because in the end of the day, we're in the human connection, human resource business, right? So you want to keep people engaged, you know, and you do a good job of, you know, making sure people get to know Brian on a personal level, but also making sure you're sprinkling in real estate stuff too. So they always remind them what you do. You know, can you walk us through like, I mean, do you have an intentional game plan with that? Or is it just kind of like every time I think of it, I just, just uh, hit it. Or, you know, can you walk us through what you do if it is intentional and then give some tips to the audience of, of how they can do what you've done there? You know, absolutely, Josh. I'm glad you brought that up. And you, you said it. People, they, they want that human connection. They want to know you. And I realized I was missing in our space. A lot of the other realtors who I saw either up and coming or that somewhat had been established, it was just real estate, real estate, real estate, real estate. And I said, you know what? People want to see more than that. I know for me, even though these guys are rock stars and they're selling a lot of houses, just seeing the listings over and over, it gets dull, right? You almost, it slips from your conscious mind of you liking them and following them to just like your, your unconscious and you just see them through your feed. And I said, you know what? I want to create uh, not only an audience of customers who love me, but also people just who follow me on the entrepreneurial side and the real estate side to say, hey, th this guy, this guy, is, I feel like I can touch him. I feel like I can connect with him. I feel like he's a real person. And I felt like that was missing. So there is an element of strategy to it. And because I didn't see anybody else doing it, I said, well, there's a twofold opportunity here. Number one is to actually be somebody in the space who does this on a higher level than everybody else. But secondly, it's really just create that connection. And I feel like a lot of people haven't done that. And that's why I see a lot of the newer people coming into the industry or a lot of people in general connecting with me. And it's getting crazy, Josh. I'm getting messages from people saying, hey, I took an Uber in Miami and I brought up real estate and the guy said he watched your videos, right? I went to Jamba Juice last night around the corner here, dude. And at like 9 p.m., they're about to close. And some guy's like, hey, BC, dude, I watch you on a YouTube. I'm getting my real estate license. So, and, and I knew it had that, I knew it would have that effect. You see, I was able to see that ahead of time because it was missing. So it 100% is a strategy. And if people feel like they can connect with you and they know you, then they're going to remember you. And you're just going to have that, that pull that nobody else has. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, dude. And then, um, when it comes to expireds and, and your door knocking, and I, I, I think we talked about this in the first session too, but, yeah. uh, cause you're, you're, you're still in your market. I, I'm assuming from what I see that inventory is still pretty low and it's, it's, you know, hard to get listings. People want listings. Absolutely. What kind of effort does it take to go out there and, and get those? I mean, what, when your numbers like, I mean, just, I think agents that jump in that space, they just give up so damn quick. Oh man, I called 30 and I got, I didn't get a listing appointment, expires don't work or, you know, right? Like walk us through kind of an idea of what that frequency is, how many calls, how many conversations, how many two appointments set and then same thing on, you know, how many doors knock to equate to that. Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting that you brought that up. Uh, people, uh, they want that instant gratification and you know, we've made some tweaks, but to start with the new expire, it takes a tremendous amount of effort, Josh. I mean, we're in low inventory, even homes that are overpriced. A lot of times are selling at ridiculous terms that you look at this deal and you're like, how is this even happening? So it does take a lot of effort because these people are getting hit a lot and, you know, you're going up against 10, 15, 20, 50, hundred people calling them. So a lot of times I think we've averaged it out. If we call a new expired or talk to them, a lot of times if we do get an opportunity to meet with them, and put them back on the market, it's taking anywhere from six to eight weeks. Yeah. Right? And that's just an average of what we're looking at. A lot of them aren't going to be ready just now. So it, it takes that, that long-term approach. And I think, uh, I mean, we see the statistic, I'm sure you've seen that meme. It's like 
80% of your sales are going to come between your fifth and your 12th contact. So I think for us to even get an appointment with an expired right now, it's taking an average of like 5.8 calls or something like that. We averaged it out. So it's literally, it falls in that window of that statistic. And, but we're being creative, man. I'm doing, uh, I'll pop by every once in a while if I'm in the area. We're doing a lot of uh, video through email and texting, which is huge that I still think a lot of people aren't doing. And one of the biggest reasons I'm getting from people that they meet with us is from the video text. They're saying, we love that. Nobody was doing it. That's awesome. And then they go to YouTube or if they go on our social media, then it's game over because they see the kind of reach that we have. But um, for new expireds, yeah, 5.8 calls, right, uh, to get uh, an appointment right now. As far as conversions, our conversions are pretty good. I think we're doing, if we go on a listing appointment, we're getting, I think it's like 8.1 out of 10. So we're actually doing a really good job of going and converting. Now, one thing that we've kind of thrown in there that's different that I see a lot of people not doing on a high level is we're really focusing, Josh, on older expireds, anywhere from six months all the way up to three or four years. Those are requiring more follow-ups. I think that's around eight calls to convert. But overall, I would say this year we're going to do anywhere from eight to about 10 transactions uh, just from the old expires, just adding that in, right? And all we did was we pulled up some of the old records, scrubbed them to see if they were relisted, threw them in our dialer, started door knocking a couple a day, and within a couple months, boom, we just started converting like crazy. So when you say those numbers like 5.8 or, or ew, with the older expires, eight calls, is that, I mean, are you seeing that's eight dials to that one expired lead before you get the listing appointment? Hmm. No, that's conversations. Okay, so conversations. So if you're at a 10%, you know, so you're talking, you know, anywhere between 50 or yeah. 58 to 80 dials to have that amount of conversations to get that, that listing. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, I'll set an appointment on the spot, but then it gets canceled or we have to, you know, push it back or whatever. And the average for the newer ones is around 5.8, I think 5.7. And then for the older ones, it's almost double in. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are probably going to be shocked because they think we're all these, you know, hot shot, call somebody one time and close them. But I would say more than half the time, if I call them and I get an appointment right away, we have to reschedule or something happens for us to push it back. So, you know, if you're not following up, ladies and gentlemen, you're, you're throwing away a lot of money. And it's not just about being skilled to get them that first time. You have to be ready for the long game. And uh, it took me a while to figure that out too, Josh, and I suffered a little bit from it because I was the same way. Oh, man, I've called this guy three times and it's not working out, whatever, and I just throw him away. When if I would have called one or two more times, I would have gotten it. So that's definitely a, a take-home lesson for us. Yeah, so then with these with these expires, because you talked also about, you know, because you're doing some video texting, um, but then you also talked about a pop-by, man. I mean, is it is it, uh, is it a combination of all those things, man? Because it sounds like you're aggressive with all of those things. Yeah, you know, it, it really is because some things click differently with different people. And I think it's that plus the sheer volume of staying in front of them. And again, we're not shoving it down their throat every time we talk to them. You know, it's like, hey, Bob, we spoke last month. I know you're on track to meet with us in about three weeks. Is that still the case? Is there anything I can do right now to help you out? Anything you need from me or from us? And I'm just, I'm staying in their face because uh, I don't know if you saw this video that Tony Robbins posted. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, Josh, but he said, and this is at the time, like 2008, he said, for somebody to remember your brand in 2008 or nine now compared to the 90s, in the 90s, they had to see your name four times, right? By 2009, it was 16. So you can imagine now in 2017, they probably have to see you 100 times to even remember who you are or what you represent. And that really stuck in my mind. And I said, I got to be everywhere. I got to door knock these people, video text them, text them. And that's literally, literally what it takes. Until we combined everything at a high frequency, we weren't seeing that recognition or branding. And we already felt like we were doing it, but we had to take it up two more notches just to be remembered. Yeah. So then and I know you guys can link to Brian's first episode. Um, I think where you went through what your scripts are with that initial call. Um, I think we went through that. Um, yeah, we did. We did. But then, okay. So then like with your door knocking dude that you're doing, I mean, is that the vast majority of door? Is like expired is really the focus right now. And, and, and is that the focus with the door knocking as well? Uh, right now. Yeah. Especially if we're talking priorities, absolutely. The first thing we'll hit is, is those new expires, right? Uh, we have a, a list I actually made a YouTube video about it. Cause a lot of people ask me that, but the fresh expires for sure, some FISBOs and we're, we're finding right now that because inventory is tight and those expires and FISBO numbers are dwindling, we have to do a lot of just 
like random just as it just sold or just cold doors and, and, and cold calls. Uh, another niche that we found that's very lucrative for us right now too is absentee owners, right? People who have the multi-units or a single family that they don't live in that's not their primary residence. And we're pitching to people to do a 1031 or, you know, increase their cash flow and that's working. So I think for most people, especially in markets like this, you have to get creative, right? Those old school expired and physical things are still going to work. But if you want to keep growing and scale, you have to do different things. And I think people just get caught up with one type of lead source. And then when that dries up, they're kind of like in a frantic panic, like, oh, what do I do next? Yeah. Yep. Agree, dude, 100%, man. So then when you pop by these, when you, whether it's an expired or, or a FISBO, man, I mean, you know, I have found like when you do a pop by, like, you always want to have something of value to offer them, you know, right? So, um, I mean, what does that pop by look like? Is it just an introduction or is it, uh, hey, wanted to introduce myself? I know we, you, you've, you've probably got my voicemails. We've talked, we talked on the phone. Just want to introduce myself in person. Also, I wanted to drop off you know, these reports or whatever this is to you, how to prep your home for sale guide that I thought you might find helpful or an updated CMA. Like, are you having things of value to give them at that time too? Usually, initially, I, I do my best to get their email. Like the first contact almost always is just an introduction. From there, uh, when I get their email, which is like 99% of the time, what you just described is what we do. How to prep your home and stuff like that. We have that like on automatic. If I do pop by, uh, personally, I might give them, you know, like a, a market update for that zip code or that area, which literally... Uh, I could go on dqnews.com. I don't know if that website works for you guys over there in Arizona, but it literally gives you a breakdown, a quick one of like zip codes, what's sold, the price increase year over year. It's really cool. And it's just at the click of a button. I'll maybe print that out, give them a snippet of that. Uh, But that's pretty much it. Everything else that we delivered to like a FISBO or an expired that would be an item of value, they're getting it through our drip system. I'm just reminding them if I pop by, hey, did you get the email yesterday? We sent it with the, you know, how to prep your home. And a lot of times, because we are giving them something in those emails, they do actually look at them because we can check in our open rate for FISBOs is actually pretty good. It's around, uh, I think, like 47 or 48%. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Dude. Where, where, where are you getting your data from um, for all of this, for, for expired FISBOs? And then it sounds like you're doing an element of circle prospecting too. Yeah. Um, what, where are you getting that data from? We do a ton, man. I'm on the Haynes directory, which allows me to pull all the public records for random calls. Uh, for just this is just sold and you know all that stuff and just cold doors we're also on Vulcan 7 mainly for the expireds because in the LA area it's extremely accurate I'm getting cell phones sometimes emails and we also have the the Red X right because that one I use specifically to take the data from the MLS I export it in a CSV file an Excel file upload it to Red X especially the older expires, which is the focus. And then it scrubs to make sure any of them aren't relisted or sold. And then it'll leave you a list of who still never went back on the market or sold. And then we can flood that to either door knock or upload it to Mojo to call. And then obviously we use the triple line Mojo dialer. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So then, um, all right, man. So you got all this going on, you know, and, and, and you're continuing this growth. I mean, yeah. do you have, a long term, because I know you got other things going on too that we're going to talk about here in just a second. You know, yeah. your, your your speaking gigs are blowing up and all this other stuff. I mean, but do you have a like a long term vision of where you want to take your real estate business? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I do want to be what they coined in the book the seventh level, where I'm completely leveraged out. Um, but I do see my team being anywhere from six to seven agents, nothing too big. But I, I want it to be a, a team that produces at least one and a half or two million uh, GCI a year. That, that, that's the immediate vision that I have. As far as long term, I do see us being a household name brand here in Southern California. I really do see it. And that's just something I had in the head or in my head from the beginning because I was offered to join a lot of teams when I started that were actually productive around here. There's a team around here that sells 120, 130 homes. And they were after me a lot because they knew I was hustling. And I always had that vision in my mind. I was like, nope, uh, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I, I want to do my own thing. So for me, that vision is constantly evolving, but I do see it being something where, you know, people start talking real estate, you know, Team BC is going to pop up because, you know, we're that household brand. Yeah. Yep. Love it, dude. So, so if we were to break down the last 12 months, um, you know, it doesn't sound to me from our last conversation yeah. when it comes to actual lead gen marketing prospects, whatever the hell people want to call it strategies. Like it doesn't seem like anything's really changed. What's really changed is you've dialed in your processes, your systems, and you've leveraged the right people 
so you can do more of these things. And the reason I'm asking this is because people are always looking for that magic pill, you know, and I'm like, no, the only magic pill is consistency. Right. And, 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 you know, but if you get those processes and systems out and learn how to leverage the correct way, man, it's game over. I mean, would you see that that's the correct assessment? Absolutely, man. And like I told you, literally, I think it was yesterday, we just signed up to start doing this stuff with Facebook. So it's literally been a mastery of systems processes and having more people doing it. You said it. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, so okay. This thing with Facebook, I mean, are you the, the strategy you have going forward with it? I know it hasn't been tested yet. You know, right. This is something new that you're bringing on, but is it just straight? You just lead generating lead, lead conversion or is there other strategies that you're bringing on with that? Uh, as, as far as I know right now, it's just lead gen lead conversion. Um, again, I'm having, uh, Lloyda handle that cause she's on, on the techie side and eventually we're going to hire somebody to completely, uh, govern that process because I know it is a little bit hands-on and you have to be on there a little bit every day and those kind of things. But part of it's automated, but the main point of it is yeah. Lead gen lead conversion. Yeah. Yeah, love it, dude. So, um, you know, in, in our last conversation, you know, I know that uh, you, you had you, at the time, I mean, you, you had already started doing some coaching as well and had some programs out there, but I know that that's really blown up as well and evolved into speaking. So talk about that, man. Like, you know, this, this, this is just taking on some crazy journeys, man. So like what, what's happened last 12 months with all these other aspects of your life? Well, it's a great question, Josh, and it's interesting, man. It's been a it's been an evolution, right? This is something because when I started doing the products and stuff, it was literally because I had so many people messaging me like, "Hey, bro, do you have like a product for door knocking? Hey, do you ever speak or do this?" And I was like, you know what? I kind of planted the seed in my brain. I was like, if people are asking and going out of their way to request it, there's probably a market there or a, you know a need. And I started doing it, and I realized like, man, this is so fun. Like, I enjoy doing it, but it's fun. Right. Like I just did a speaking gig in June with uh, Josh from a million dollar listing and a couple other guys. And I was like, man, like this is a blast having hundreds of people here. And the main thing that really uh, cemented it as something that I wanted to do was just the messages you would get after I was getting, you know, calls, voicemails and messages on Facebook and emails like, dude, that event like transformed everything. I'm killing it now. Like, thank you so much. I was like, wow, this is really having a strong impact on the audience, much stronger than I would have thought. And it just evolved from there and it snowballed. I just kicked it into hyper gear because you know how we are. We do everything 10x. So I started doing a monthly product. Um, I started doing, you know, monthly speaking events. I do coach, but that's kind of something I do just on the side. I only have like three or four guys. And it, it's just really turned into something that I truly enjoy, impacts a lot of people. And I see it getting very, very big. I've already booked a speaking gig for next year in Australia, man. It's going to be yeah, I think Arnold's going to speak on the panel. It's going to be like eight or nine guys. It's going to be dope, dude. Yeah, that's insane, man. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, I mean, we've all seen it. We've all seen all uh, or known of or heard of, you know, that entrepreneur out there that makes a ton of money, but it's, you know, if they're all about the money and they, they lack that fulfillment piece, you know, right? Like it, it's just this, this becomes this miserable journey. You know, it's, it's when you, when you can combine, Hey, how do I go out there, make money, co- provide opportunities for myself, my family, yeah. and put in this impact piece. And at the end of the day, like speaking, even if you get to the point where like a Grant Cardone that they're paying 50 grand for an hour to come speak, yeah. I'm sure the dude loses money when he speaks. He commit, you know, right? But the impact becomes huge. So it's having those components, man, and right. it creates such insane fulfillment. So um, do, you, do you find yourself though, because I've went through this, right? Uh, um, you know, with being in these different spaces, you know, sometimes you get those internal wars going on. Like, do you find yourself being more pulled to one than the other or do you just have such a love for both that you see yourself to always doing both? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I get pulled every once in a while. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. That's a good way of, a uh, good metaphor of it. I do, but I've learned to just go with it, man. You know, uh, I, I've, I've had a past where I used to resist things all the time and I said, you know what? I'm going to, all I'm going to do is make sure that I'm, I'm doing the right things, right? As long as I'm happy to me, that's senior, right? So if I end up getting pulled one way and I become unhappy, I'm going to go the other, right? And I've just, I've really learned to uh, trust myself. Uh, I think a lot of us, a lot of times we have that gut feeling of doing something and we don't do it. And then, you know, we have our head on the pillow at night. We're like, oh man, I should have said that thing to that person, or I should have done that one thing. I've learned to just kind of embrace that man. And I'm more of a shoot first, ask questions later. So as, as I'm being pulled and I, if I realize there's a shift there or I'm not enjoying this anymore, then I stop 
or I'm like, okay, I'm not enjoying the real estate side as much. Let me leverage more. Let me get out of it. Or if it's the other side I start to not like, I just start putting pieces in place. But so far, so good. I don't think we're ever going to find that perfect limbo, you know, where I was going to have some kind of, you know, conflict, but hey, that's part of life. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, as you're experiencing all this growth, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's all amazing stuff, you know, right? Um, but I'm, I, I'm imagining, I'm sure, right? It's not always easy. I mean, growth pains can be sometimes harder than slow pains. Mm-hmm. As you've been experiencing this growth, what have been some of the obstacles maybe that you didn't expect to have, but have come up that you've had to overcome and, and uh, you know, overcome those challenges? Yeah. Man, there's a lot, Josh. One is people that you started the journey with now kind of turning on you or becoming a little bit jealous or resentful towards your success, right? Maybe somebody who feels like, hey, you should have brought me with you, right? I've experienced some of that in the last couple of months that caught me a little bit by surprise, right? Uh, another thing is the, the more you get out in the public eye, I didn't realize, I mean, I know we get a lot of hate or, or negative comments, but the, I guess you can say the, some people are just so like hard about it. I'm like, man, it doesn't affect me, but I'm like, what would possess that person or that entity or that business to attack me so hard? Like, it doesn't make any sense because that type of attack would require like time and effort, you know? Uh, I guess that, that kind of surprised me too, you know? Cause I, I knew we were gonna get hate being out there anyway, cause people are just not gonna like you. Whether you do things right by the book or you don't, there's always gonna be a section of people that don't like you. Uh, another thing too was really, uh, pushing myself on the real estate side, right? That that was another challenge. I knew it would push me out of my comfort zone to continue doing what I'm doing and pushing the limits and growing and investing money without, you know, the promise of any return. But that really has been a, a mental barrier for me, more so on the real estate side than on the everything else. Like everything else, it seems like I have no filter and I just go. But with the real estate side, it's almost like I've created this little baby and I want to like almost like nurture it too much, you know, and pet it. So whenever I expose it to the elements, it's kind of like, oh man, I don't want it to get hurt. Um, other than that, also realizing that, um, you have to embrace a lot of parts of this journey, uh, being an Eagle, you know, being alone. I thought by this point, maybe I would have more people around me. I guess you can say that I could count on like a, like a, a Robin to a Batman or something like that. And I'm realizing the deeper you get into this man, finding the people in our mental headspace or our frequency is it's becoming more of a rare thing, right? And as you ascend higher and higher, there's less people you can break bread with, I guess you can say, and and be with on that level. When I thought maybe there would be more. So sometimes I guess the challenge would be the element of feeling a little bit alone, right? Feeling like you are an eagle, but it's like, dude, I'm looking around. I don't see any other eagles. Where are they at? Luckily, the internet has made that easier. But, um, you know, it's been a constant evolution. And at the same time, these new little thoughts and challenges come up. But off the top of my head, that would be a couple. Uh, I guess the, the last one would be just my insatiable appetite, maybe for constant and never ending improvement, like Tony Robbins says, right? Like I have a beautiful home here with a nice view, dude, but I'm already looking at one higher up on the hill saying, man, I need to jump up and get that one. That's the one to get. So, yeah. Uh, but it, it, is that really a challenge? Uh, probably not. It's actually a blessing. So uh, yeah. that's all I can really think of, man, right now. Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So yeah. And, and, you know, success is a, it is a lonely road, right? I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, not, not that they're don't like you or enjoy you, but the fact that they're around you and seeing you do big things, it makes them feel internally not so good about themselves because they're not stepping into their own greatness and they see you doing it. And, and it becomes that a very lonely journey, right? Especially in the beginning, dude. I mean, it's, you know, I remember going, you know, three or four years where it was just like, you just feel like you're in this path alone. Like even with your, your closest friends, families, loved ones, whatever, like a lot of people just don't understand why you do what you do. Um, how, how have you coped with the loneliness? Because I, I think that that's something that breaks a lot of people on this journey. They just, is, and they start turning to self-destructive things and, you know, whatever. How have you successfully coped with the loneliness? Well, there's a couple of things I've done. Number one is uh, I've embraced it, right? I've realized that it is part of the journey, right? If you're an eagle, you are going to be alone, especially for long amounts of time. Two is mentorship, right? I'm always looking at individuals like yourself and other people who maybe are closer here that I can, you know, have a chat with or, or link up with that really just give me more guidance and give me more insight and more wisdom on the process and where I'm at. And other than that, well, one thing that I really enjoy that helps me with that is just going out all the time. I, I usually go out like two two nights a week and just socializing, man, and just interacting with the world. I think that really is what 
helps me, uh, you know, open up and just, I'm not, I'm not saying I go out and party and do drugs and that kind of stuff. Not at all. I go out a lot of times. I don't even have a sip of alcohol, but I just go out and socialize and have a good time. I, I think part of the reason that uh, some of us maybe fall into our own world is we're so stuck on the grind. If we were to take an hour to go out, maybe one or two nights a week, just to unload and socialize and be a butterfly. I think that really feeds your soul. And that I've noticed recently has been something that has just, uh, that candle light has been dimming a little bit. It's just, gotten much bigger doing that and I think that really is the key for me and I truly believe it would help a lot of people if they would just get out there and just interact with the world yeah yeah it's, it's like being intentional like you gotta you gotta you gotta plan it out a, a social life plan you know right because it I mean you know it's so like six months ago or so I um did some remodeling in my house and I put in like the, I'm at my home office right now so I'm, I work from home probably 99 percent of the time unless I have to go in the studio for filming or whatever but dude it's like I'll literally sometimes go four days without leaving my house. I mean, I started going to the gym, but that's it. And then I'm like, damn, like, yeah, I find myself now the same thing. Like, it's like, man, I got to start planning. Like, yeah. cause I'm becoming a hermit, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm becoming socially awkward. Cause I'm like, now nah, I'm, I, I'm guessing like I knew, I, I knew your disc. Have you ever done the disc test? Yeah. yeah. Are you, are you a high I? High D. High, high D. And then, I mean, what, what's your, what's your eye on there? I don't I mean, remember, man. I, okay. I don't remember. All I remember is like the D. I'm like, there's only this much space left for me to be more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's 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 all, you know, most drivers, right? You know, and, and uh, you know, but for me, I'm like you, you know, 99D. So I got, you know, one left from being at the top. Um, but I'm like 10 on the I, right? So I'm a very introverted person. So yeah, if I don't have that plan, dude, it's it's easy yeah. for me to get sucked into, you know, again, becoming that hermit and, right, and right. yeah, and then almost becoming socially awkward. It's like, you gotta learn, relearn how to freaking talk to people. Exactly, dude. Right. Yeah, because right. It's kind of funky. Um, yeah, I love it, dude. So then, and I just want to ask this to you because, you know, obviously you're having a lot of success with, with a lot of different things, but you know, the, I mean, this is a, a, mainly a real estate podcast. Most of our listeners are realtors um, that, are, that are wanting to go out there and grow their business yeah. and attack expires and door knock and, you know, would you say that the success is in the scripts or would you say it's really just in that massive consistency and just fucking straight up hard ass work? <sighs> That's a great question, Josh. Um, I truly do believe senior to everything. Of course, these other factors can't be denied like skills and that kind of stuff, but it is a consistency, man, because through this, concept of consistency you're going to have so many things thrown at you right your own uh self-doubt other people's criticisms and doubt right inconsistency and cash flow from deals not going through things not going your way so many things out of your control are going to jump and try to get in the path of you being consistent i think it's overcoming those obstacles and being consistent and really sticking to it 100 percent that really is what, what makes it happen for people and a lot of people will say they're consistent, but when I really begin to have conversations with them, I realize very quickly they're fooling themselves, right? So I think it's an element of being honest with yourself, but at the same time, you have to be consistent, dude. You know it more than anybody, right? Like you just said it, being in there four days by yourself, that's consistency, man, right? Like that is that is literally the epitome of consistency. So I remember when I started, I, I would have days where I'd lock myself in one of the offices, one of the little side offices for like four hours, dude, and just cold call. And I was like, I have to make this thing happen. And I always tell people it's consistency in the times that you don't feel like doing it or you have an excuse and you actually hold true to it. That's what I believe is a true element to success. Because when people were taking the days off because they had a cough, I was on the phones and on the doors. When people uh, were feeling a little bit under the weather because it was raining, I was in the office making calls, right? When somebody had a little fender bender or their, their tire uh, got disinflated or pinched and it took a chunk or two out of their day, like an hour or two, and then they took the rest of the day off, I still showed up to the office and made my calls. That's really what I believe the recipe is for success, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I, could, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's one of, cause like, like I am, I am not a talented dude on the phones. Right. Um, I mean, I've gotten decent at it. Right. Um, you know, but I, I've met so many people that run circles around me with, with their, just their phone skills. They just got the gift to gab and they just have this gift of mirroring personalities. And I'm so like to the point results driven, the D so high, like, yeah. you know, right. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, dude, you can't beat the guy or girl that's not, that, that's willing to not eat, sleep, and will outwork everybody. Um, and, and as you said, yeah, consistency, again, man, it's the only magic pill. And would you say that 
a lot of this has come from, you know, cause you were a professional athlete and, um, you know, there too, right. It's, it's that hard work. I mean, hard work beats talent, man. Would you say a lot of that is what laid that groundwork, which made you so successful to hit a level over there that what, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but 0.01% of humanity can ever get to, um, that really laid the foundation for you to, to carry that over here. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, what I did with sports was that dedication, right? Now, w- what I did was when I looked at real estate or a lot of the stuff that we look at in the entrepreneurial space, a lot of people I noticed immediately are already looking at limitations or possibilities of failure, right? Like somebody will come to you and say, hey, you know, Josh, I want to get in the market where you're at, but it's so competitive. Do you think I can make it? That's one way of looking at it. I looked at it from the perspective of, okay, let's look at real estate. What do I bring to the table as an individual? Well, I'm highly disciplined. I'll show up first, leave last. I'm committed. I'm super competitive. I'll make it happen, right? That same person could come at it from this angle or the angle that I just said, but the angle that I just said is an empowering look at it and something that you can take and actually apply and get going versus the other person who's already defeating themselves before they start. That really is what it is, man. Because uh, like, like you just said, I'm not special, right? I'm sure there's people better than me on the phone. There was, when I started, dude, I remember going door knocking the first, uh, the first door, Josh. I had a backpack on, dude. I had a little circuit <laughs> for the one fellow with a backpack on, nervous, knocked on the door, and I said, oh, I hope they don't answer. I was that bad, dude. I literally had my script with me, bro. And I was like, I brought a few questions to ask you. Is it cool? She's like, yeah, sure. And it went super well. But I was that bad, right? But I was just willing to fail and learn. So I I think it's a matter of people's own internal process when they look at this thing of real estate or anything in life. Or you're approaching it from the, I'm looking for a way to to fail or I'm trying to figure out how I can not fail. Or you're looking at it from, what do I bring to the table that I can apply here that's really going to help me break through? Yeah. Yeah. I love it, dude. So I, I just uh, hired a, a new phone coach, if you will, that's coaching my ISAs one-on-one and also some of my other sales guys and other businesses. Yeah. And he came in on Tuesday and spent like 10 hours with just, just my phone sales team. Wow. And um, you know, the first probably three or four hours, he just focused just on what you just said with that mindset, like visioning yourself as a champion, right? Vision yourself as a winner every day before you start picking up those dials or knocking those doors, visualize um, what it already feels like to win, setting X amount of appointments. And, and you know, um, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that that is of probably highest importance, you know, right? And I mean, do you have a routine that you go through similar to that where you visualize yourself winning and what that's going to be? Cause it's, it's so hard, right? Cause then all of a sudden you, you, like you said, you jump on your YouTube account, you got eight hate comments. And then on your Facebook, you got all these, you know, all this bullshit people talking smack. And then you jump on the phone here and you get rejected by 42 people. And you know, right. Like what do you do to keep that mental mindset so strong? Well, uh, it started with a lot of the classic stuff that we learn in self-help man, affirmations, you know, taking the time. I remember reading, my first couple NLP books and it takes you through visualization exercises. Now, what most people don't do, dude, is they don't stop right there in the book to do it. I would stop, close the book, do the exercise over and over until I really got it. And now with a lot of those basic principles that anybody could YouTube, it's gotten to the point now where that's like my, my operation mode. Now I don't have to think about that stuff anymore. Right? Like I, I tell people my visualization process dude is so strong now. I, cause you know, I, I got that Lambo a couple months ago. I just had a random thought of like me crashing into it. And you know what my response was, dude? I got out of it. I got out and I was like laughing. I was like, ah, no big deal. It'll get fixed. Here's my information. Where most people, their thought would be negative or them getting out and yelling at the other person, ripping them a new one. Like, hey, man, what's going on? So I've literally reprogrammed myself to be that way, right? But it starts with the fundamentals that you guys can learn from Tony Robbins or anybody out there that I got for free from YouTube right? How to visualize, how to think positive. You guys all have that power. We live in the information age where you can literally get everything, right? You go on Josh's channel, how many interviews does he have with just rock stars, right? You go to mine, I've made over 600 videos now, either on real estate or mindset, right? And, and you hit the head on the nail, dude, because that's something that I focus on on my products. If I do a three hour product, an hour or an hour and a half of it is the mindset, that really is the key because you could give somebody the tools of the trade to do what you did and shorten it to two or three years. And if they follow it, they'll live the life that you live. But if their internal process isn't there, man, they're not going to execute it on the level that you executed it at. And I think people 
it, it stems back to the instant gratification. Oh, just uh, give me that magic line, Josh, for the script, you know, so I can get the appointment. When if it doesn't come from the right perspective, it's not going to work anyway, right? Yeah. And I, I, I truly believe it's key, man. And I've just dedicated myself, like in the morning still, I take uh, about 20 minutes to meditate. And I take about 15 to 20 minutes to visualize my day, my year. And I'm already thinking, right? All my actions now are coming from the pers perspective of what would the five-year ahead version of me be doing right now? Would he be complaining that he feels under the weather or would he make the call? Would he go out there and knock on those doors or would he complain, right? So I'm always coming from that future perspective of who I want to be and where I'm going to be at. And that just completely empowers you. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, dude. And I mean, I mean, you, you, you read the classics, think and grow rich, you know, right. Where, where visualization is talked so heavily in there. And even like one of my favorite books, which is kind of a, uh, an oldie now, but it's psychology is selling by Brian Tracy. And yep. it goes so deep into the affirmations and that being such a big part of increasing that internal self-confidence to go out there and sell. And a lot of people think it's, you know, woo woo or whatever, but it's like, all right, you know, when it comes to affirmations, Muhammad Ali, announced to the world that he was the greatest way before he was the greatest. Yep. Michael Jordan would play the game in his head every night before he even played the game. You know, the most decorated Olympic athlete of all time, Michael Phelps, you know, right. in that one race where he won the gold medal that his goggles malfunction. And essentially he went blind in the water and still won the gold medal and being interviewed. They're like, how did you do it? He's like, I'd already ran the race thousands of times in my head. Like I knew like I already won it in my head. And then I also, I didn't need to see, like I knew exactly how many strokes, where everything was at because he ran it so many times in his head, you know? So I know a lot of people discount it, but it's like, there, there's a reason the greats do it, you know, um, that becomes so powerful. Um, now you, th this is something that, you know, I've fallen short on, I haven't done, but again, this new phone coach has, has been uh, really pounding in on us. Like every time you get an objection, right? Like maybe you get off the phone, you got an objection and the whether the call didn't go well or didn't go, wasn't an A level call, right. you know, right? And he's like, pause right there, reflect, and then, and then come up with three paths mm -hmm. that you can successfully overcome that objection, right? Do you have some type of a hyper awareness routine like that? So you can learn on a hyper focused level from each and every, you know, call or door knock that you're doing? Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that dude. I remember when I was new, when I was brand new and that would happen, whether at the door or on the phone, that I don't know if I read it or if just instinctively it came to me. Like if, if I left that door knock or call and we hung up and I didn't know, right. It was an objection. I would write the objection down and my homework that night, that very night was to come up with at least three responses for it. So it's funny that you said three and, and that's what I did. Right. Uh, and now I still do the same thing or I reflect back on those three that I know that are my go-to. I'm like, Oh, okay. I could have delivered it a little bit better. So absolutely, man. Cause uh, it, that's a trait of the best. You're always constantly refining the fundamentals and then still improving. Right. I, I think a lot of people will have a little bit of success and then internally they bought into the belief that they've made it. And you all, you know, you're either growing or you're dying. And at that point I tell people, if you think you've made it, that's when you're going to slowly start crashing. So you have to constantly, you know, sharp, sharpen the ax, uh, you know, sharpen your pencil because, you have to, right? Everything is changing. Everything is evolving. The only constant is going to be change. And maybe a line that worked a year ago for you won't work now and you have to adjust. That's why you got to have three or four, but you always got to be, you know, in the gym working on your, your routines, your right hook, you know, your jab. Because if you're not, two things are going to happen. Your skills are going to slowly go down. And number two, you're going to have guys like us coming up in the game who are going to catch up to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I mean, people get so down on themselves about the, the, you know, the failed calls or the failed appointments, you know, right. And, you know, like when I reflect like my listing presentation, you know, didn't become to what I feel is a world-class listing presentation with a, you know, 90 plus percent conversion ratio of conduction to sign listing contract, but that didn't get that good by the ones I won. It was all the ones I lost, you know, right. And getting out of my ego enough and, and, and stepping out of my emotions where I'd call the home seller to ask for their honest feedback, you know, congratulate them on their decision and ask like, why'd you choose the other agent? What could I do to improve? Right. You know, those things. And that's what created it good. Right. So this thing that so many people fear these rejections, whatever, that's where the growth is. If you do exactly what you said and really reflect and allow those to be those growth moments. Absolutely, man. I tell people the, the way for you to grow, I think this is scientifically proven, man. I don't know if I read it in a book. I think I did in the, I don't know if you read the book, The Talent Code. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a badass book, dude. He says like when you're flirting with the edge, right? With that one seller who maybe just throws that right hook that you didn't expect, that's where you get better, man. 
the same thing that people resist is actually what's the stepping stone to glory and to get better. So you're in this limbo where like you want to do it, but you don't. And when I read that, I was like, man, no wonder I did well, because without knowing it, I was embracing that process, right? I love being at the edge, right? Standing over the over the cliff and looking down and saying, man, I hope this parachute goes and just going and then pulling the string and hoping that it opens. You know what I mean? Willing to go through that, willing to go through the adrenaline. Cause I tell people and, until you really start pushing yourself where you have that situation where that seller tests you, you don't know how good you are. Number one. And number two, you don't have the opportunity to demonstrate who you are and really push it to the next level. Yeah. Well, it just goes back to like your, 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 you know, basketball career. It's like, if you just play dudes, you could school all day long. You're not growing. Like you, you need to play that guy here and there that whoops your ass, you know, right. That, that, that can challenge you. And I was uh, um, having a conversation with uh, one of the top tennis coaches out there. Yeah. And he's like, look, with my students, you know, I want to put them in a bracket where they win 60% of the time and lose 40% of the time. That's the ideal, right? You want them winning a little bit more than they're losing. So they don't get, you know, self-defeated, yeah. but if they're not also losing that 40% of the time, it's not challenging to level up. And like, he's like, that's that magic number of, of challenge. Like they have to lose, yeah. you know, right. To, to keep yeah. leveling up, man. I'm sitting there thinking of my business. All right, man. You know, at that time, like what, where am I at right now that I'm losing that can be that obstacle, that puzzle, that challenge to keep expanding me, you know, and, and so damn powerful, dude. That's a genius way, man. 60, 40. I love it. Yeah. Take that one down in my notes, dude. Yeah. So, so you got, you got the Lambo, dude, huh? Damn, man. Yeah, it's, it, it was a bittersweet moment, dude, taking that picture off the wall. I had always wanted one. I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of like old school Japanese cars and cars that aren't really that expensive. But for me, that was a goal that really pushed me and challenged me. So uh, I remember being a kid and being told I would never have one. So I kind of had that chip on my shoulder, like, you know what? I'm going to get one, you know? And I've had it and it's just been a, a dream experience, dude. I bought it the right way, right? I got a... I put a lot of money down. I got a really, really low. I got a 2% interest rate on the loan from the portion that I did get a loan on. So, I mean, it's just beautiful, man. I did everything the right way. So I pat myself on the back buying it. Yeah. Now, now that you own it, man, is it, is it, is it, is it a suite of, of victories you thought it would be, or is it just kind of, all right, it was cool for like a month and now what's next? Well, it, it's forced a lot, Josh. It, it forced me again, or maybe just put things in perspective that, man, like now that I have the Lamborghini, like, okay, dude, like you're, you're at this level now. Like everything has to be Lamborghini level. Like the interior of your house has to be Lamborghini level. So I remodeled a little bit in my house, got some new stuff freshened up. You know, my office space, I decorated it. Dude, my new office space, I probably spent 20, 25 grand decking it out. But it has to be, everything has to be Lamborghini level to me. So if anything, it did that. But secondly, it forced me to take a big step up in my thinking too. Cause I'm like, okay, I have it now, but what's next? Right now it has to be like jet yacht Bugatti. Yeah. Like it has to be like, <laughs> okay, right. Cause if we don't even conceive that or think that, how are we going to really shoot for it? You know what I mean? And for all of you watching, it, it doesn't have to be cars for you, but you need to put something in your head that really pushes you to the next level. Because now thinking about, for example, getting a jet for me, it's like, well, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Cause it's like, whoa, you know, just feeling that thing up is like 10 or 20 grand every time you fly it. So you got to be balling on a certain level to get something like that. So what's, what's the next step for me to begin the climb to get to that next level? Yeah. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, no, I love it, dude. It's uh, yeah. Cause I mean, it, it, it comes down to a point where when it's about the money, yeah. like you get to a point where there's enough, yeah. you know, right. Where, and, and we see this happen all the time where we're good enough becomes the worst enemy to greatness. And, and you always got to have, you know, that, that massive reach, whatever that is, dude. I mean, what's that saying? Uh, uh, a man's reach should always exceed his grasp. You know, if not, what's, what's the, what's a heaven for however it goes. Right. Um, so, so with that being said, what keeps you, you know, cause you could be like, all right, dude, I got my team, you know, rolling. I got the products are selling good. You know, I could, I could, I could kind of back off and chill a little bit and, and still live a great, comfortable life for the rest of my life. Like what keeps you personally, not allowing yourself to, to get into good enough? Great question, Josh. Uh, a, a lot of it is, number one, like we said earlier, it's uh, even before I think we recorded, it was a challenge, right? I don't know if we were recording that, but I love to challenge myself. That's something that I believe a lot of people can tap into, right, that we did as kids, right? Because I remember seeing other kids do like a backflip into a pool and I couldn't. I was like, man, I want to be able to do that. So I remember going to like a public pool and practicing all the time because of the challenge. So part of it for me is that, but secondly, I'm always looking at people like Elon Musk or somebody out there just moving to shake. I'm like, man, I think I'm doing it good. I'm at a level one compared to that guy. He's on level a thousand. So with me, it's 
taking advantage of this world that we live in where everything is so close. You know, I'm seeing already people coming up on YouTube that are 18 that are buying Lamborghinis. So I'm like, dude, like that's, that's nothing, right? What's next? I'm looking at guys like Grant Cardone who are buying, you know, 64 unit buildings every month. I'm like, dang. So with me, it's, it's also looking at other people, whether it's in our space or not, that are really just, you know, pushing the envelope and saying, wow, if they can do it, like I, I need to do that or exceed it more. So I, I think it's putting things in your sights that are bigger because if you just constantly surround yourself with what you have or what would be average, because a lot of people uh, I notice start making money, but they stay in that same neighborhood where everyone's making less than them. So they feel like they're the man until they step up and see you or somebody like that. And I think it's forcing yourself to set your ego aside, your own personal ego and look at other people that are doing better than you and saying, okay, uh, I'm going to go after him. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it, man. Um, so when it comes to your, your internal thought processes, right? Um, one thing that I find with uh, uh, successful people is they just think different. It's just how it, just how it rolls. Like they, 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 you know, they don't view things as being hard. They view it as a challenge, you know, right? Like you, you've said that word many times. They don't, they don't review, view something as a problem. They, they view it as a puzzle. And how do I solve this puzzle? And um, with that being said, man, when you're going through a tough time, whether it's with a, on a personal level, relationship level, business level, like what is your internal thought process to, to go out there and overcome that difficult time and not let that defeat you or, or stifle your success and growth? Well, first of all is, uh, and I believe this is a trap for most people, if something happens, they immediately uh, only focus on what the issue is at hand and they're not focusing on the solution. I know we've heard that from Tony Robbins where it's like 80% of your time spent on the solution, 20% on the problem. So I adopted something like that, right? I'm immediately looking for, I'm not looking for a reason why it happened or making myself a victim. I'm looking, okay, this happened, right? Let's say I just lost $20,000. What's the quickest way to recover and then grow from it, right? I'm already looking for the solution. Uh, a, a lot of it, man, I, I think it's just come from experience, right? I used to beat myself up all the time. And I remember having vivid memories of that and like how bad I would get and how low I would get. And I said, I, you get to the point where you're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I just cannot do this anymore. And one new concept that I introduced to my mind, I think I learned it from some like uh, video I was watching dude on YouTube about hypnosis. He said, uh, it might've been hypnosis. I don't even know, but he said, why don't you look at everything occurring in your life, whether it's positive or negative as, especially a negative thing as a test to see if you're worthy of the next breakthrough or the next step. And that really is what flipped that switch, Josh, because when I started doing that, I said, okay, this event happened like uh, my car, right? Like I just, uh, one of my rims basically got destroyed on the Lambo, right? So I'm like, okay, that's a test. I, I didn't have one ounce of like frustration or anger. I was like, this is a test. What's coming? So now that frustration or anger turns into excitement. Like, oh, what's coming? Like I have a breakthrough coming, bring it on. And I think that, that little personal shift that I did just completely, uh, change that because now when things like that happen, especially things out of my control, I don't, I don't freak out about it, dude. I don't, I don't go through the regular emotional process that the average person goes through where they feel like a victim and they become depressed or sad or angry. I've like completely broken out of that, but it's been for the audience to get a takeaway. It's my own conscious process that I adopted, right? It's not like you're going to listen to Josh or me and you're going to feel better. It's you have to take action and say, okay, what can I do now and implement to get me out of this or to, not allow me to fall into the cycle. And I, I really think it's when you take personal control and you start doing things that it really begins to shift things for you. Yeah, yeah, love it, couldn't agree more, man. So those that are watching and listening, man, I mean, I know you've got um, uh, coaching products, you coach, you got, you got products people can buy to, to learn how to become better door knockers, callers, uh, all this stuff. If, if people want to learn more about you, that maybe this is their first experience with you, if they want to follow you, um, you know, check out some of your content, where's the best place to do all of that? I would say two. Uh, if you guys see my name here on the interview, uh, if you put that together.com, that's my website. I have everything laid out there, events, products, everything that you can see that I have to offer. Other than that, it would be my YouTube channel. I'm coming out with a new video almost every single day, either catered towards salespeople, real estate, mindset. It's basically on one side of the page, it's me documenting my journey as a real estate person, entrepreneur, and me growing in life. And on the second one, it's lessons that I've learned that I've adopted in my life or big breakthroughs that I've had, I'm sharing on camera so everybody can learn from it 
right? Because a lot of the stuff that I've done on YouTube has been, I learn something, I go through a moment, I apply that teaching, I have a breakthrough, boom, I share it on camera. Because I want people to find out what it's like to actually apply a lot of this knowledge from books. A lot of you may be reading, but you're not applying, or you're learning from somebody who's just spitting theory. When you look at Josh and me, we're actually learning these concepts and applying them in real time, and then we make a video to give you that knowledge of the application of it, which I feel is key, especially in 2017. Yep. Yep. Love it, man. Couldn't agree more, dude. So uh, those watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation truly is just the start of delusion. Um, information is no longer power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on that creates the power that allows you to go out there and create the life you truly know you want and deserve. And Brian shared so many amazing nuggets with you, so many amazing pieces of advice with you um, today. Make sure to link to his first podcast, which is badass. Uh, um, we went a lot more tactical in the scripts and things like that. Um, we'll have all Brian's uh, links below to his YouTube channel, social media links, as well as his website. So check that out. And Brian, man, it's always an honor. Dude. I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here, dude. Of course, brother. Thanks for having me. Next one we can do uh, in your studio. I'll take a trip out to Arizona. Yeah, that'd be sick, man. 100%. All right, you guys. Well, thank you again. We'll see you next time.